Happy fall. It's cool outside. If you're, from the, if you're not from the south, I want to let you in on a secret that we southerners know. This is called fake fall. And so what happens is you clear off your back porch, your front porch, it takes you all day, and you go and you get your pumpkin spice latte, and like, oh man, fall is here. And then the next day it feels like the surface of the sun again. And so you really can't depend on the weather at this particular time of year, but we can depend on certain things. School is back in session. So excited. Uh, School is back in session. All of the kids' activities and travel sports and all that stuff, that is kicked back into gear. College football is back. Wonderful, excellent. But then my favorite, if you groan, that means you're an Alabama fan, but uh, the rest of us are really excited about it. But one of my favorite pieces, though, of this particular time of year, just as with the beginning of any new season, is this is throwaway season. It means this is the time of the year where I get to throw a bunch of stuff out from my house. And if you have a, a healthy marriage like I do, you probably have a split marriage, which is healthy for a family, and that one of you loves throwing things away, and the other one is a hoarder. So I am the one that absolutely loves throwing things away to a point at which my wife actually has to put notes on things in the garage. If she leaves kind of a dinged up end table in the garage, I come out there and I go, oh boy, I can put this in my car and take it to a dump somewhere. And so she has learned after several errors to leave a note on there. It says, no dummy, I plan on painting this to make it nice again. So I won't take it. Because when I see a pile of things in the garage, I see that as a basically just something that I can throw away. If I see a box of toys in the garage and the top toy is broken, just for efficiency's sake, I make an assumption the entire box is broken. And so I take that box to Goodwill or I throw it away or wherever it might be because I love getting, giving stuff away and getting rid of things. There's two great joys that I have in my life. It's throwing things away and canceled plans. Love both of those things. But of course, my wife loves to hang on to things. And, and she kind of wins the battle a little bit more now uh, when our older two kind of grew out of the baby phase and the baby stroller phase, all that kind of stuff. I gave away a whole bunch of our baby stuff. And then we had our third. And we had to go to our friends and ask for our stuff back. So you don't always want to <clears throat> just give away everything without really paying attention to it. You can give, if you give everything away, if you throw out a whole box of stuff, you can end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And that is the theming and the theme within our text in Matthew chapter 13 this morning. So we'll be in Matthew chapter 13, and there's actually two passages in Matthew chapter 13 that we're going to look at, and they're both about the same parable, but the first parable, the parable it's told is so confusing, Jesus comes back several verses later to explain it. So in this first reading, if you don't understand it, that's okay. Jesus is actually going to explain it to us in a later passage. But the whole theming of it is if you just throw an entire box of stuff away because the thing that you see on top is broken or damaged, you may be throwing out some good stuff that exists underneath. So it says this beginning in Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, and the weeds also appear. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. So confusing passage, but they would have understood the visual probably a bit more than we perhaps would in 2023. In, the, in that region of the world that particular time, wheat and weeds looked the exact same when they were young. An immature stalk of wheat looked just like a weed. They were both just green. 
And so you could walk through a field And if you didn't know any better, you could see just a whole bunch of green and think, oh, wow, I should go and mow that down, get some fertilizer and start over with that field because it is only weeds. But what Jesus is playing on is this imagery of knowing that once the wheat matures, then there's an obvious difference. Once the wheat matures, now it has buds. You think of the the picture of of a wheat field kind of blowing gently in the wind with the the light tan buds and things like that. That's a mature stalk of wheat. That's ready to be harvested. That's ready to be turned into certain produce. But when it's young, wheat and weeds look the same. So what he's saying is an immature believer or a new believer and a non-believer are oftentimes going to look the same. Before I became the full-time director at Camp Lighthouse, I spent the majority of my career in student ministry. And I can absolutely tell you to be the case. Because what we want to happen is we want for someone to go on a mission trip or retreat or whatever, and they go from being a little green weed to all of a sudden being a fully bloomed uh, stalk of wheat. And that's not how it happens. Salvation is instantaneous. Sanctification, which is the church word for becoming Christ-like, is a process. And so it means you're going to take, as I have countless times, a 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th grader on a retreat or a mission trip, and they're going to come to know who Jesus is for the very, very first time. And they're going to get back, and they're going to get back into the stress of the school year. They're going to get back into football season. And their lives, for a while, aren't going to look a lot different than their non-believer friends. And we in the church sometimes take it upon ourselves to be like, well, we need to root that out. Jesus is saying inside of this passage, be patient because the weed, the non-believer, is going to look a lot like an immature stalk of wheat. And so allow it to have time to mature. And then at the harvest, we will truly know which one is which. So a question for you this morning How can you tell the difference in a non-believer and a new believer? You can't. Unless they have told you directly with their mouth, I believe in Jesus, you typically can't because the process of becoming Christ-like is a process. Salvation, instantaneous, eternally secure. The process of becoming Christ-like is a life long journey. And at the beginning of that journey, your life is going to look just the same because you haven't begun to give over all of those things to the Lord that you hung on to in your non-believer state. And so the parable first and foremost becomes a warning to us, a warning to us as believers that we wouldn't see a field of presumable weeds and mow the entire thing down because he's saying because in that process if you go and just start grabbing handfuls and throwing them in the fire because you think that they're wasteful you're actually going to throw in there wheat and we don't want to be doing that and so then Jesus goes on as I said it's a very confusing passage I've read this passage many times before and it can be really confusing so then Jesus unpacks this there's time and time again where Jesus actually tells his disciples he says hey I'm going to speak in parables Because the secrets of the kingdom at this particular time are only going to be revealed to those who are actually following me. And so the disciples go, yeah, 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 Jesus, cool, we're we're with you. And then later on when they're in private, they'll look at him and be like, hey man, we didn't catch a lick of that. (laughs) Can you please catch us up? And so that's what we're doing in this second passage. So verse 36 says, when he left the crowd, he being Jesus, when he left the crowd and went into the house, his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. That means the wheat, the good seed was the ones that became wheat. Good seed came from Jesus and Jesus alone. That's what he's saying. That should be comforting to us. It should be comforting in that a lot of times, especially if you grew up in like youth group culture in the 90s, if you're about my age, it was all about, hey, can you save your friends? Here's the deal. You didn't save yourself from your sins. How on earth are you going to save somebody else from theirs? It doesn't mean we don't have a role to play, but Jesus is quite clear here in saying who the sower is. Jesus is the one who sows good seed and he only sows good seed. 
So that means that that is not our role in this particular passage to force things to be wheat or to be weeds. Jesus is the one who plants the wheat. Verse 38, the field is the world. So the field is the world. The entire world we need to view in the context of this passage is one big giant field. And inside of that field is a couple of different plants, two to be specific. And Jesus is the one that has planted all of the good ones. It says this in the rest of verse 38. And the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. So when he's saying this, he's speaking to a predominantly Jewish audience. And so they wouldn't have really, they would not have yet equated salvation to being a Jesus follower. And so he's using language that he's used before and uses a lot of other places of scripture of someone who's in the kingdom, the good seeds, the wheat are those who are citizens in the kingdom. People that are builders of the kingdom, a part of the kingdom of God, those are the good seeds. For us today, now that we actually know how all of this ends, now that we have the full story, I'm going to simplify it today instead of it being the good seeds being people from the kingdom, the wheat is Jesus' followers. That's it. The only type of wheat is Jesus' followers. The only way to being in the kingdom is to be a Jesus follower. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is not another way. There is only one type of wheat. And that type of wheat is the good seed planted by Jesus. And for us, it is the followers of Jesus. And so we are the wheat those of us that are followers of Christ. Then it goes on to say this, the weeds are the people of the, in, of the evil one and the enemy who sows them is the devil. Now this is the part in 2023 that you're really not gonna like. The weeds are Satan followers. There's only two types of people in this world, Jesus followers and Satan followers. And that really doesn't stick well in 2023 because we have this, this theological tolerance culture. We're like, well, you're allowed to believe what you want to believe and you can follow your truth and all those things. Here's the deal. From a socio-political standpoint, I absolutely stand behind people being able to follow their beliefs and practice their beliefs how they feel convicted. I, I, I am a recipient and you are a recipient of the freedom we have in this country to practice and follow any belief that we choose. And I think that should be the practice of a healthy nation. However... That's where it stops. It does not bleed over into theology. And so if you are not a follower of Jesus, you are a follower of Satan. I mean, let me explain this though. That doesn't mean that everybody that's not a follower of Jesus has like a black cloak and like a scepter and they gather around a pentagram with fire candles and they, and they chant all kinds of strange things. That's not what I'm talking about. What it means is that anybody not following Jesus is following Satan because Satan's chief game and only goal in life is to get you not to follow Jesus. And so sure, there are small cultish sects that actually do those things. But if money is your God, you don't follow money. You follow Satan. If your children have become your trophy, you don't follow your children. You're a Satan follower. If you believe in another theology other than Jesus being the only way into the kingdom, including every other world religion, you're not really that world religion. You're a Satan follower. I don't mean that you have some kind of nefarious plans like murder everybody in your path, but here, quite clearly, Jesus says there are two types of people. There is wheat, those who follow Jesus, and there are weeds, those who follow Satan. He doesn't say, and there's, those, there's dandelions, and they just kind of blow in the wind and do what they want to, and eventually they get to be a good person and go to heaven. It doesn't say that. It says there are two types of people, wheat and weeds. And it goes on. It says the harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. Let me repeat that. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are are angels. The harvest time is not now. And the harvesters are not us. To make sure that theologically we're talking about the same thing, angels are not people who have passed away. Your loved ones who have followed Christ and believe in Christ are eternally unified with their maker in heaven. They don't become angels. 
Angels are separate creations because if we believe in a heavenly realm, there must therefore be heavenly beings and creatures and that's what angels are. And angels, unlike us, have been given the gifts of God to be able to see into someone's heart and truly determine, is this thing wheat or is this thing a weed? And so that should both convict us and give us a little bit of comfort. In the end, it's not my choice who goes to heaven or hell. I'm super glad of that lack of responsibility, but I should also smack it between the eyes that it's also not my choice of who gets to go either. The only thing I can be clear on is what I read in this, but I am not the harvester and neither are you, which means we have not been given the responsibility to go into the field of the world and start just mowing stuff down because God hasn't given us the gifts to be able to tell the difference in a weed and just an immature stalk of wheat. Because if we judge the immature stalk of wheat, the one who believes that Jesus is the way, but is still trying to figure it out, or, and he, he, he say this, time is different for us than it is for God, or the one who is not yet come to understand who Jesus is. They have not yet had their moment in God's timeline for their life. That is also an immature stalk of wheat. And so if we go in with our judgment and mow all of that down, then we're going to be getting rid of wheat that just hasn't fully matured yet. And so that is the role of the angels. Verse 40, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be the end of age. I'm sorry, let me go back. There's one other character that we, we didn't talk about that's not in this second description. So in the first description, we have the sower is Jesus, the field is the world, the wheat is the Jesus followers, the weeds are Satan followers, the harvest is the angels. There's one more character that got mentioned in the first chunk that we didn't talk about. It's the servants. The servants in the first passage. Remember, they went to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, there's a bunch of weeds in the field. Do you want us to pull them up? Those are his disciples. His disciples go to Jesus and say, hey, there's a bunch of stuff going on. Do you want us to root it? It kind of reminds you of when James and John say, hey, do you want us to call thunderbolts down in this town? And Jesus is like, no, chill out. <laughs> Give it a moment, guys. Gosh, that escalated quickly. And so the servants are the disciples. The servants are us. Remember, we are not the harvesters. The only job of the servant in the field was to go and simply till the soil. They didn't do any of the planting. Jesus planted all the good seeds, Satan planted all the bad seeds. The servants go into the field to tend the field, to take care of the field, but they are not the harvesters. And so it's important for us to understand our role in that, that our role is not that we would cast judgment on anyone because judgment is what the angels are going to be used for. Then it goes on in verse 40. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The son of man will send his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. The angels, the angels, they, they, the angels, they is not referring to the servants. They is not referring to the disciples. They is referring to the angels. The angels will come and weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. Our task as disciples and followers of Christ is not to root out every bit of sin that we see around us. We're gonna get to some other pieces in just a moment about what our role is. That is the role of Jesus. For only Jesus can truly root out sin. So it says this, verse 42 They'll be thrown into the blazing furnace where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Jesus is both simple and complicated, amen? And so this passage can be complicated, especially through the context of other teachings. Because right here it's saying, inside this field, there's weeds from Satan that are going to eventually be thrown into the fire. There is wheat, which comes from Jesus, which leads to eternal life, which will eventually be in the barn or be shining in the sun, as these two passages say. 
But those other passages, though, seem as if we are supposed to take action sooner rather than later. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and he goes through a pretty long discourse on what we should do when it comes to sin. And he has one particular passage where he says this. He says, if your hand causes you to sin, you should cut it off so that it wouldn't cause you to sin any longer. And you say, well, that seems different than what this passage is saying. This passage is saying to let the field stay, even though inside that field you have sinners and Jesus followers all together. And so this seems different. But that passage, Matthew 5, is not talking about your brother's hand. The passage doesn't say, if your brother's hand causes him to sin, you should go and chop off your brother's hand. It is a mirror. It is an internally focused passage in Matthew 5, where it says, if something is causing you to sin, you should cut that piece out of your life. That is a part of tilling your own soil. Or Matthew chapter 10 We see a passage where Jesus sends out his disciples in pairs of two, and they are going out to tell people to repent for the kingdom is near. And when he sends them out, he says this, he says, when you go into a town and they receive you, stay there for as long as your ministry is bearing fruit. But if the town won't hear what you have to say, wipe the dust off your feet because it would be better for that town to have never existed. And you'd be like, wow, it seems like we're here, it's, it's a very different passage. It's saying that we're going to wipe that whole town out because they won't believe the message of the gospel. No, no, no. What Jesus is doing is clearly painting a picture for our role in the equation. When he's sending out those disciples, he's saying, it is your job to share the good news about Jesus. It's not your job to make people believe the good news about Jesus. And so when he gives that, that wording and that, that, that explanation to the disciples as he's sending them out, that is not meant to be for them to have permission to judge that town. It's for them to have permission to stay in their lane. My job is to merely share the good news, but it's not on me. It's not my responsibility. It's not on my shoulders if that person doesn't choose to hear it. The only calling I've been given is to share it in the first place. Or Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11 is intense. It's all these woes. It's woe to the unrepentant for this, woe to the unrepentant for this. Here's what Matthew chapter 11 is saying, similar to this passage, is it's saying there is a judgment coming. We don't like to think about it. We love to think that everybody that we've ever met in our life just gets to be a good person and be unified with God and go to heaven. But that's not actually how it happens. That's not actually the truth of scripture. So Matthew chapter 11 is not giving the disciples permission to cast judgment and woes upon entire groups of people. What it's trying to unpack for them in a very real way is saying, for those who are unrepentant and choose not to follow me, there is an eventual judgment coming. Or finally, you think about Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, disciples come to Jesus and say, Jesus, how much are we supposed to get forgive somebody? Seven times? And he says, no, 70 times seven. And they go through this whole uh, teaching essentially on how you should deal with sin inside of the church. If a brother sins against you, you should go directly to that person. If he won't listen, you should bring another person. If still they won't listen, you should bring it in front of the entire body. And if they won't listen after that, then you should cast them out of the fellowship of believers. And you'd be like, That seems like chopping out the weeds, though. It seems to contradict Jesus' teaching in Matthew 13, but that is totally different. The teaching in Matthew chapter 18 is about accountability, and there's a huge difference there. If there's anything clear from those teachings in Matthew 13, it's that judgment belongs to God and God alone. However, what role we have in the equation is accountability amongst other believers. And so give you an example. I have a group of men that I meet with every single Wednesday night. Them coming to my group, they may not know this or not, but them coming to my group by being there in attendance, they are giving me permission to say, your life is looking really weedy right now. That's accountability. I've been tasked with that. I'm a servant in their field. My job is to help till the field around them just as their job is to till the field around me. That's accountability. What I shouldn't be doing is being somebody on the street corner going up to random people and saying, fat weed, fat weed, fat weed, fat weed, and say, that's it. You're all going to hell because that's not the role I've been given. Judgment is for the Lord only. But there is a space for accountability inside of a relational discipleship ministry. 
And so we see a few things in this passage that Jesus teaches us. The first thing that Jesus teaches is that evil is real and hell exists. Evil is real and hell exists. We don't like to think about that and we don't talk about that enough. Sheer logic tells you that hell has to exist. Because of a couple of passages like this that refer to burning and because of Dante's Inferno, we have this visual of hell being this this burning fire pit type of thing. Here's what hell is. If the kingdom of God in heaven is complete union with God, then hell is complete separation from him. Quite simply, that's what it is. And for there to be a space where there's complete union with God, logically, there has to be something that's not that. There has to be an opposite. And so hell has to exist. And evil has to exist because it's the mechanism that draws us there. And so that part of the teaching should give us some urgency. We should have some urgency about us that there are a lot of weeds all around us. There are a lot of weeds everywhere we go in life. And this is not a message about how all of the wheat should just clump together in their own little field and not worry about the weeds. That's not what I'm talking about. What this is saying is that there are people in your life that you may not know that they are, but they are a weed. And by definition, they are bound for eternal separation from God. And that should give us some urgency that there are people in our lives whose soil needs tilling. It's not up to us to save them. We have no ability to turn them from weed into wheat. But we should have some urgency about ourselves that there are weeds all around us desperately in need of hope. Second thing that Jesus teaches us is that judgment is God's and God's alone. In ancient times and medieval culture, you typically had a king's sword or a queen's sword. The job of the king or queen's sword was to do all of the beheading. Kings didn't behead people themselves. They had a guy for that. Just like you have a tax accountant, they had beheaders. And so they would have a person that when judgment was cast from the king, this person would execute that judgment by doing the beheading. We, as followers of Christ, had not been given the task of being the king's sword. Romans 12, 19 says, vengeance is mine, says Alan. Nope. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Meaning judgment only belongs to God. We have no space in our faith system to cast judgment on anyone, for that is not our role. Accountability in the context of faith relationships, 100%. But we are not called to be judged, for that is God's role alone. And the third piece that's important for us to understand in the context of the first one, give it time and keep tending the field. There is an urgency and a wait for a while in this passage, which can feel conflicting. The urgency of this passage is that hell is real and it exists. And there are weeds all around us that are bound for that space. But what the passage would tell us is, don't be so quick to name which one is which. Don't be so quick to come down on the immature stalk of wheat that's still trying to figure it out. You have people that in your lives that they they believe in Jesus, but they don't know what that means fully yet. They're still growing in that space. Small group leaders in the student ministry, we share that role together with our students. That's our job, is to walk alongside and till the soil of perhaps immature wheat, not cast judgment on the decisions that they make while they're in the development and maturing process. And you can apply that as parents to your kids, even your adult children. Our job is to give it time. Jesus is working and doing something real. Give it time. Your only job inside of that season is to till the soil. So there's this urgency, but there's also a wait. And don't be so quick to judge. So what can we do with this? What can we as individual followers of Christ do with this? First and foremost, we can look at our own roots. This should be, if not anything, first a space of internal self-reflection. Am I truly following Jesus? Am I truly rooted in the soil? Am I truly following him? And am I truly a stalk of wheat 
or if I just got really good at pretending like I am one. And so the first piece is that we should focus on our own soil and we should actually look different. Our lives should look different. The, the passage is warning and saying, hey, immature wheat and weeds look the same. And so don't cast judgment on it because they're often going to look a lot alike. There's a challenge in this also is that then we shouldn't look like them. <laughs> we should get to a space of spiritual maturity where our lives and priorities look different than all of the weeds around us. Secondly, focus on the other wheat. And again, I'm not talking about creating holy huddles. But what I mean is that you need to be co-anchored in soil together with a group of other believers so that you can be strengthened by mutual nourishment. So you can be strengthened by that, that mutual accountability. And so instead of worrying about all of the sins of the world, we spend way too much time scrolling through Facebook and on the news, looking at all of the evils of the world, when there's people right in front of you in your real life who are fellow wheat that need you to lean into them just a little bit. And finally, that we would give grace to the immature. That we would give grace to the immature and not cast judgment on people when they're still in the space and phase in their life where they're trying to figure it out. First Peter 3.15, one of my favorite scriptures, says always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. But the second part's super, super important. It says, but do so with gentleness and respect. It doesn't say to do so with judgment and a heavy hammer. And so what I know is this from this passage, hell is real, evil exists, but hope does too. And so our role in this is the role of the servant, that we would till the soil of the people in our lives and sow seeds of hope, but do so through gentleness and respect, that they themselves may also mature into those strong followers of Christ. Let me pray for